it to Scott Davis. There is to be late drama. Davis, uh, good to see you again. Good to speak to you. And um, we're going to cover through the course of this interview all about your career, all about your, your football, um, all about the well documented situation in terms of, of, of what you've done since you've um, since, since you sort of ended professional football and you've been obviously um, playing um, playing for a, a number of clubs in recent years. But I obviously want to concentrate on your time at Aldershot. But Firstly, how are you? Tell, tell us how yeah, you are. Yeah, very well. Yeah, I was going to say, it's been a long seven months. Um, obviously, since the beginning of lockdown, I've not been able to work too much, uh, which has been frustrating. But it's like you say, everyone's in different situations. Um, I've managed to get out and do a few sessions at different football clubs around gambling, which has obviously played a big part in my life in the last few years. So, um, yeah, it's been frustrating. But listen, it's like you say, there's there's people worse off than, than you and I at the moment, I'm sure. So, um, glad to be here, mate. Glad to be talking to you. Um, obviously, about a club that I still absolutely adore. So, yeah, I owe him a lot for my career and the time that I had there. So, it's uh, fond memories for sure. So, let's talk about your, your early career. Talk to us about when you were a youth player. Uh, I think you're at Watford, and, and then how you have en ended up at Reading in the first instance. Yeah, so for me, I was eight or nine years old. Um, I was quite fortunate that. I suppose I was quite good back then. Um, and I had the opportunity to join quite a few different clubs, uh, your Chelsea's, your West Ham's and your clubs like that. Uh, but Watford was sort of the biggest local club to me. And I was in their satellite centre um, that was running Ellsbury where I grew up. And then one day they said they haven't got the funding for it. So it was a case of um, sort of shutting down the centre and going over and training at the, the real Watford. Um, which I was given the opportunity to do. Um, and then Wick and Wanderers actually said, do you know what, we'll take over the centre. Um, so I ended up staying there, played for Wick and Wanderers for the next five years. Um, I was quite lucky again that Nas Bashir was my coach at, um, at Wick and Wanderers and he got a job at Reading. And he said, listen, I want to take you with me. Um, sort of one of the better players, I guess, at my, uh, in my age at Wickham. And... I went over there on trial for six months and they ended up paying quite a large fee in terms of compensation when I was 14 um, and I was there for the next nine years. So from the, from a young age, I, I watched football. Um, I watched my dad play in the Conference South pretty much for 20 years. He played um, at that level till he was 41 years old. So I was around football. Um, I knew that non-league was, was a good level. Um, so when I did join all the shot, um, I thought I was going to get a move to a sort of low, um, a League Two club. Um, it didn't materialise. I ended up all the shot, and the rest is history. So it's like you say, uh, it's it's a level now. I think that probably doesn't get the respect that it deserves from professional players because there's some fantastic players in non-league, as you see, your Jamie Vardy's and players like that that are getting getting scouted now and getting taken to the top leagues and doing well. So yeah, my young my young days in football were completely um, flooded by my football um, and what and going to watch my dad my granddad so it was uh, it was great from a young age I was obsessed uh, what were the early experiences at Reading tough very tough um, I didn't think I was good enough um, I thought to myself that I'd made the step up from a school of excellence at Wickham I went over to Reading everyone seemed bigger than me stronger than me quicker than me more able than me um, and I found it really, really difficult. I was out for 14 months with stress fractures in my back when I was sort of 15 years old. And it put a bit of a downer, a bit of a, uh, a question mark over whether I was going to get a scholarship and whether I would remain at the club because I was injured for pretty much the whole year. Uh, getting out of bed in the morning, I was crying in pain. Um, it was that painful. It was awful. Um, and in the end, they showed... Um, a bit of faith in me I guess and they chose to sign me over a, an Icelandic lad that came over um, he ended up signing for Everton so he actually probably got the better part of the deal um, they chose me rather than him and I managed to sort of plug my way through the f next few years there in the youth team uh, did quite well played reserves for the f sort of first year and second year scholarship 
um, at right back out of all positions, which was probably unbeknown to a lot of Aldershot fans. I was a right back uh, when I played for, for Reading in the reserves. Um, it enabled me to go on and play for Ireland in that right back position um, because I played there for Reading. So I had a couple of strings to my bow, but I think the thing that I found the most difficult was the cutthroat nature. Um, it was it was tough. It was hard work. Um, and to be honest, adapting to life in professional football for me wasn't easy because I started to dabble in other things, like you say, gambling at the age of 16. Um, and it, it went on to play a huge part in my career, um, which I live with now with many regrets, I guess. People will say, listen, you've, you've had a great time in your career. You've got some some high moments. But I look back and think I should have done a lot better. Um, and that's not me being arrogant or anything like that. I think it's just from how I was doing to how quickly it kind of went downhill. Um, but I've only got myself to blame. Um, I don't blame anyone but myself. So it's easier to live with rather than sort of going around pointing the finger at other people saying it's, it's not my fault, it's yours. So, yeah, it's been it's been good, mate. Um, but like you say, it's, I've got a story to tell now and uh, I tell it every day. So it's, it's, it's good. And, and we'll obviously come to the, the, the gambling um, during the course of this, this interview. But how did you arrive at Aldershot Town? I think Steve Copper was your manager at Reading at the time. So you've, you've gone from Reading to Aldershot, who were, uh, you know, Gary Waddock had just uh, come in as, as a manager and you were one of his first signings. Yeah. So what happened was um, I actually had my jaw broken about six months before I joined Aldershot. And I was on a night out in town and I got punched and cleanly broke my jaw, which wasn't pleasant. Um, Steve Koppel sat me down and he said, listen, I can't be having players come into the training ground with a broken jaw. It's not how we function. It's not how we work. And he said, for the whole of next season, you're going to go out on loan. And Martin Cool uh, was my under-16s manager at Reading. Um, he was obviously assistant manager under Gary at, at Aldershot. And he said, listen, we want to take you on loan. Um, and I remember sort of being a bit annoyed about it, if I'm brutally honest, because I thought that I'd go to a football league club. Um, but when I got there, it, it was the best season of my life. I absolutely loved every minute of it. Um, the first season was was absolutely brilliant. The second season wasn't so great. But um, for me personally, I did OK. Obviously, chipped in with a few goals in both years. Uh, but it gave me a platform, I guess, to go on and play professional football for the next eight or nine years after that. Um, I always think that if I hadn't gone on loan, I might have sort of just fizzled out in terms of being in the game. You see it happen to a lot of young players now. Um, but I was given the opportunity by by Gary and uh, Cooley to to go and express myself um, without sort of any rollickings, I guess. Uh, Gary Waddock used to say to me all the time, go out there, um, express yourself, make mistakes and just enjoy it. And to hear that from a manager was like music to my ears. Um, I wasn't the kind of player that wanted to to play to the rules, I guess. I would do things out of the ordinary. Um, and that's the way that I wanted to be. And he gave me the the license to go and do that. So that's how I ended up at Aldershot. Um, obviously, the big wide world of professional football. It wasn't about performances as such anymore. It was about getting results because we were playing for people's livelihoods um, rather than playing a youth team match on a Saturday where it was all about how well you played and what information you took from the manager and then put it out onto the, fi- uh, onto the pitch. It was, listen, let's get the job done. Doesn't matter if it's not the prettiest. Uh, we're playing here for three points to get us up the table. And when I joined Aldershot, to think that obviously we would go on and achieve the success that we did, um, I think it was it was unimaginable. I don't think anyone thought that we would go on and obviously want the league like we did. I, I like the way you say you chipped in with a few goals. I think you did more than, than, than chip in for a few goals because you didn't really score goals inside the 18-yard box and you certainly didn't score any inside the six-yard box. But um, let's talk about your first goal for Aldershot because it was on your debut at Kidderminster Harriers. And there's good news for you, of course, that you scored in that game. But um, the, the bad news is I don't think it's on video anywhere anywhere in this world. So, um, And it was some goal as well. Yeah, the only place I ever had it on video was watching Satanta Sports and they showed the highlights and I recorded it on my TV um, in my parents' house back in the day. And I'd go back and watch it over and over again. I remember at halftime uh, having the first serious sort of team talk of my life because we hadn't played too well first half and um, obviously got the ball back to me in the from the kickoff in the second half. And I don't know what sort of went through my mind, but the, the player sort of came in and shut me down and I managed to sort of skip past him. And the space just seemed to open up. So I sort of 
went a little bit further and a little bit further and 25 yards out, I thought I'd unleash one um, and it nestled in the bottom corner. And do you know what? That moment was, I suppose you call it magical. It was great. It was seven seconds from kickoff. Um, but like you said, I'd love to see it on TV again, but to do it on my first professional game um, or in my first professional game was, yeah, it was very special. Um, and I think straight away that, um, that bond between the fans that I had, uh, between the All Shot fans and myself, I think grew from that day. And listen, I've I've always been a, a big believer in um, in fans and how important they are to a football club. And I've always said to people, um, they say who are the best fans that you've played under, and without doubt, if All Shot could fill a twenty thousand seat stadium, they'd be the best fans in the world in my eyes. Uh, the loudest, most passionate, um, and most loyal as well. You you see places away. We went and played at. I want to say, I want to say Morecambe um, at, one, at their old ground, and I just remember the place being packed. And I was thinking, how have so many people travelled up from down south to an away game that's so far away? Um, and we filled the far end, and it was it was just it was just crazy. But it's like you say, you, you can't put a price on things like that. And I think it's fair to say, and I think we, we forget the fact that you you were just nineteen years old at this stage. Yeah, very young. Um, but I think that's where I played with no fear. Um, I didn't really know what professional football was all about. So for me, it was go out there, um, try and get as many shots off as you can, um, work as hard as you can as well. I was probably one of those players that when things weren't going too well, um, Gary and Martin would look at and say, do you know what? It's not his type of game today. We'll have to take him off and put on maybe a Lewis Chalmers or something like that just to steady the ship. Um, I wasn't the sort of person that was going to put their foot in and make tackles. But I think the other side of my game enabled me to sort of get away with it um, because I was a, so I was a bit of a pretty footballer. I um, wanted to pass the ball. I wanted to shoot. I wanted to assist. Um, the other side of the game probably took me five or six, six years later to actually learn um, the, the ugly side of it. But it's like you said, 19, um, I ended up, I think, with 11 goals that season. Um some special goals as well. I look back at them on the, the video that Dean's made me and some of them I look back at and think I shouldn't be scoring from there. But fortunately for me, um, they, they went in one way or another and it's it's like you say, you can't put a price on those things. So let's look at that season. You know, it just it took off and it just didn't stop really in the end. You, you, gained, you gained that momentum within the dressing room and it became quite apparent at a stage thinking we've got a good chance of doing this. And then, of course, Torquay, I think at the time, were the, were the main rivals. If anybody was going to catch all the shot, it would have been Torquay. So let's talk about that Monday night in, uh, in Devon where you know, there is to be late drama, of course. It was yeah. the, it is the goal that all all the shot fans still talk about now. And I think if you go in the... Well, I'll put it out there. I think it's the, the biggest goal that, that, that's been scored in the club's history because it was really that point that people thought, here, yeah, we're going to the football league. And he yeah. scored that goal in injury time. Do you know what? My face has gone, it's gone tingly just thinking about it. Um, it's a weird one because I remember travelling down to Torquay and I'd lost my whole month's wages on the way down to Torquay playing cards. And I remember sitting in my hotel room before the game, uh, probably two, three o'clock in the afternoon, and I was worrying about the month ahead, thinking, how am I going to get to training? How am I going to pay my bills? How am I going to do this? And the joy um, of football, uh, what it brings is so magical, special, uh, because I remember all my thoughts, all my worries disappeared for a couple of days after that. Um, obviously, the ball fell loose to me. I hit, hit a nice enough strike. Um, a lot of people were blaming the keeper, saying he should have saved it. Uh, he was actually on loan from Redden as well at the time. So, I remember sort of giving him a bit of stick. Um, but it's like I say, I, I watch it back and I remember it like it was yesterday. Um, it was fantastic to be a part of, fantastic to be involved in. And the amount of people that still write on my social social media now, that night in Torquay, there is to be late drama, um, like you've already quoted. Um, just to have scored that goal and propelled us to where we got to um, and the gap that we obviously bridged between us and Torquay um, it's great that it was me to be able to do that. Um, and I think it's like you say, those moments where the bond between you and the fans and the affinity that we had um, only grew stronger from that night. But we had a great team. And there was no doubt about it. I don't think there was any um, sort of egos in the team. There wasn't anyone that was, listen, I'm, a, I'm ahead of you guys. We were all in it together on the same level. If I look back at that team now, um, I'd have to say Nicky Ball that season was 
literally insane. Some of the saves that he made, some of the games that he played, um, he he was absolutely phenomenal. Um, I've played with some great keepers in the past that have played for their countries, played in the Premier League on a number of occasions. But for me, he's still the best that I've ever played with. Um, and I would actually put him up there with one of the best players I've ever played with. And I've played with some really good players. Um, but yeah, it was, it was a team that just had a group of friends. We used to socialise together. Um, we used to have great fun in training. I used to look forward to getting up in the morning and making sure that I drove through the, those gates in the morning at the training ground because I knew that it was just going to be a, it was going to be a, uh, an atmosphere that you wanted to be a part of. Um, so we were very, very special. I think being the gambler that I was back in the day, I remember looking, thinking we're 25 to 1 um, to win the league. So I looked at it and thought, Thought I'm joining a middle of the road conference team. Um, that if we finish in the playoffs, we've done well. Um, I think we won by 15 points in the end of the league, was it? So like to that. look back on it uh, and obviously make history, get the club back in the football league, it was it, it was just phenomenal. And I can always remember we we did it, of course, a few weeks later at Exeter City on a on a Tuesday night. And, and I can always remember you hobbling around on your crutches because obviously you'd got injured by between the the Torquay game. I think it was at the end of March you got injured and. Uh, then so you're, you're, you're rolling around on crutches and um, but knowing you must have known on that pitch at Exeter when everyone's celebrating with the fans how much you a part you played in that in that success it was a strange one because I've been playing from about November time um, with an injury and I needed an operation on it and I was just like listen there's no way I'm missing this season because we were doing so well so I played for injury for a lot of that season. Um, I spoke to the surgeon and said, I need to delay it. And I actually got sent off, I want to say at Droylston. And yeah, I didn't want to pick it up. Scott, yeah, but yeah, it was, yeah. We, I, got sent <laughs> off, I got sent off at Droylston, which meant that I had a six game ban. So it enabled me to get my operation done sooner. So I had the operation done in London um, on the morning of the game. And they said, listen, you need to stay in overnight. Uh, and then obviously leave tomorrow, you can be discharged. And I said, there's no way that's happening. I said, if my team get promoted tonight down in Exeter, I'll make sure I'm there. So having the parents that I had, I was really lucky. My dad picked me up from uh, from Chelsea, I think it was, the, the private hospital. It was a nice little place. And I said, listen, dad, you need to take me to Exeter. So he picked me up. We drove down to Exeter. Um, and then when the final whistle went, I threw my crutches up in the air and I started bouncing down the pitch with my leg in plaster. Um, but there was no way I could have missed that, not in a million years. Uh, so the surgeon wasn't too happy. And I remember sort of getting a phone call from my physio at Reading. Uh, he'd seen the video footage of me running down the pitch. Um, but like you say, it just takes over um, the, the euphoria and whatnot. It's just special. So I was out of control. Um, I needed to be a part of it. And that night in Exeter, I remember being in the changing room and just thinking to myself how lucky I am to play professional football um, to have the achievement that we've had with these lads and also John McGinty. Um, I remember him being there and he had tears in his eyes and it was just so special, um, so, so special. And I, if I have one regret, my one regret is that I've not gone back to play for Aldershot in my sort of later days. Um, that's one thing I would have loved to have done. Um, obviously, I'm getting a little bit older and stuff now, so that ship sailed, but... Yeah, no, it's, it, it was such a such a great night. Um, but it's like you say, it's it's just unimaginable to think of what we achieved. I was the young, inex young, inexperienced um, apprentice when it came to card games. I didn't really know the rules of the game. And little did I know that I was going to be terrible at it. I sort of found myself finishing training and going to the bookmakers every single day. Um, I'd go to the casino till late at night by myself. Uh, obviously ended up spending close to a quarter of a million pounds over the next sort of nine years doing it.